Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Today, we are going to be talking about two um, kind of non-realistic uh, theater practitioners, although they're very, very different and have very different in uh, kind of effects on um, theater as a whole. Um, Antonin Artaud and Samuel Beckett. We're going to start with Artaud. Um, so uh, let me see here. Right. So Antonin Artaud. Uh, born in 1896, uh, died in 1948. Um, he was French, uh, hence the name Antonin Artaud, uh, but of Greek ancestry. He was conscripted into the army in 1916 during World War I, uh, similar to um, uh, Brecht was. He was discharged, though, um, because he was addicted to painkillers uh, and because of various mental instability. Uh, he wrote a lot. Uh, he was also an actor, a director, a poet, essayist. Uh, and he uh, died because of a drug overdose uh, in a psychiatric clinic. So this is a, uh, an image of uh, Mr. Artaud uh, later on in life. Um, but this one's much more pleasant as him as a younger person. Now, in order to understand uh, Artaud, uh, the easiest way to do that is to uh, uh, start off by uh, uh, encountering him in his own words, right? Because he uh disagrees with aristotelian drama and one of the few people who actually disagrees with shakespeare <laughs> instead of just trying to claim shakespeare as part of uh, a movement that uh, they are um but so what what he said at, at one point was let us leave textual criticism to graduate students formal criticism to aesthetes and recognize that what has been said is not still to be said that an expression does not have the same value twice does not live two lives, that all words once spoken are dead and function only at the moment when they are uttered, that a form once it has served cannot be used again and asks only to repla be replaced by another, and that the theater is the only place in the world where a gesture once made can never be made the same way twice. So Artaud is uh, thinking about theater um, as uh, as distinct from other works of art because of its live nature, right? And because of its, uh, you know, ephemeral nature that you uh, cannot put on the same play twice because the actors will not say the words the same way. They will not move exactly the same way. They will not come into the theater uh, with, you know, you know, eating, having eaten the same breakfast with the same temperatures, right? Uh, thinking the same thoughts and everything. And so why even try? Right, and so it would be a fiction to um, try to put on the same play more than once, right? To think that the theater is could be anything but just happening once and then that's it, right? Um, he says, the idea of a detached art of poetry as a charm which exists only to distract our leisure is a decadent idea and an unmistakable symptom of our power to castrate. Okay, so he's, he's thinking that like uh, theater should not be thought of as entertainment, as detached from regular life or some sort of kind of leisure free time activity. No, no, no. It is more than that. It is more uh, primary to our experience of life, according to Artaud. Now, Artaud, um, looking at uh, Shakespeare, he says that Shakespeare is responsible for this aberration and decline, the disinterested idea of the theater which wishes a theatrical performance to leave the public intact without setting off one image that will shake the organism to its foundation and leave an ineffaceable scar, right? So he, in this way, agrees with Brecht that uh, theater should not leave the audience, uh, should not have the audience exit the theater in the same way that they came in, right? Um, uh, Arto thought that theater should be in that sort of sense traumatic, not necessarily as in damaging per se, but definitely affecting and life changing because it just happens once. Um, and as long as the theater itself limits itself to showing us intimate scenes from the lives of a few puppets, uh, read that as being realism. Transforming the public into peeping toms, it is no wonder the elite abandoned it and the great public looks to the movies, the music hall, or the circuits for violent satisfactions who in, whose intentions do not deceive them, right? So he's saying that theater as it is constituted in that day, right? And this is again, a reaction to realism, that theater is presuming to allow the public in uh, 
through a window or, you know, four walls or, you know, a room with a wall missing as one might, you know, derisively call realism. Um, you know, and saying that, well, yeah, theater is kind of telling you that you are a spectator watching the lives of uh, people who you do not know and who do not know you are there, but that is not true. You're not doing that, right? It is a lie if the theater is telling the audience that they are watching something real going on, right? In this way, he agrees with, with Brecht, but he takes a very different departure on what theater should be then instead. It is a question then of making the theater in the proper sense of the word a function, something as localized and as precise as circulation of blood in the arteries or the apparently chaotic development of dream images in the brain. And this is to be accomplished by a thorough involvement, a genuine enslavement of the attention. Ah. So for Artaud, what theater is looking to do has more to do with sensation and image and sound rather than things like character and story and even rather politics in kind of a broader kind of societal level. Artaud is like, uh, Artaud would be thinking, no, human beings primarily are animals, right? And we experience the world, not first and foremost through our brains. We experience the world through our eyes and our touch our sensation, what we hear. And so that part of us is the most foundational part of being a human being. Because if being a human being is at its base, a kind of animal and at its base, furthermore, a sensing thing, an entity that experiences, then that, if we touch the part of humanity that is primarily experiential rather than thinking, if it's experiential, that is coming at theater from the root, right? So he talks about this thing that he's, uh, this idea of theater that he developed called the theater of cruelty. Now, he, he is um, he is a little bit kind of uh, uh, edgy in that way. He used theater of cruelty to mean um, rigor, implacable attention and decision, irreversible and absolute determination rather than, you know, theater of being mean to other people, right? That kind of cruelty. But, you know, he's the type of, um, he's the type of theater practitioner to, uh, to uh, pick words that are deliberately provocative, right? To describe his kinds of theater. So he picked theater of cruelty. So if you're trying to create some sort of theater that um, uh, speaks to people as experience and on the level of kind of, uh, 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 unconscious metaphor rather than kind of conscious storyline and you know beginning middle and end and character arcs and that kind of thing what does it look at what does it look like well if we remember and again i say this all the time but going back to aristotle where he looked at the six elements of uh tragedy and he put spectacle down at the bottom arto is like no that actually should be at the top right spectacle is the thing that touches our senses first. And so that is the point of departure, right? That is the thing by which you build everything else around it, right? You should not, for example, start with a plot and then think about how it looks and then stage it. No, you should start with an image and then think what story would, or story is even loose, but what kind of occurrence would make this image uh, uh, make more sense, right? And so for Artaud, the actor is both an element of first importance and is, since it is upon the effectiveness of his work, and a pardon, I didn't do the quotation, but this is his word, so pardon again the pronouns, that the success of the spectacle depends, and a kind of passive and neutral element since he is rigorously denied all personal initiative, right? So in order to, uh, in order for the uh, director, creator, auteur, as it were, to uh, shape very specifically what a theatrical performance is, you have to take agency away and any kind of spontaneity away um, from uh, the actors, really, and anyone else. He says, we shall not act a written play, but we shall make attempts at direct staging around themes, facts, or known works. Now, this is a little bit like, what in the world does this mean? So Artaud wrote uh, a play, his most famous play um, is called uh, A Spurt of Blood or A Jet of Blood. It is very short. 
And I'm going to put it up and uh, uh, have you look at a couple of different um, things about his place. So you can kind of understand the uh, distance from conventional theater that Artaud is operating under. So this play, it's A Spurt of Blood, translated by Ruby Cohn, right? This is his play. Now, it's not very long. It's not very long at all. But I just want to read a couple of these stage directions, right? So, well, here. So you have all these characters and you start a young man. I love you and everything is beautiful. A young girl with quavering voice. You love me and everything is beautiful. Young man in a lower tone. I love you and everything is beautiful. She responds, you love me and everything is beautiful. Young man leaving her abruptly. I love you. Silence. Face me. Young girl. There. Young man in an exalted high-pitched voice. I love you. I am great. I am lucid. I am full. I am dense. Young girl in the same high-pitched voice. We love each other. Young man, we are intense. Ah, oh, how beautifully the world is built. And then notice these stage directions. Silence. There is a noise as if an immense wheel were turning and moving the air. Okay. A hurricane separates them. All right. At the same time, two stars are seen colliding and from them fall a series of legs of living flesh with feet, hands, scalps, masks, colonnades, porticos, temples, alembics falling more and more slowly as if falling in a vacuum. Then three scorpions, one after another, and finally a frog and a beetle, which come to rest with desperate slowness, nauseating slowness. All right, so if you read that and don't think at some point, how in the world would you stage that? What does that mean? Our toe is not so much concerned <laughs> with what it means other than kind of implying that it has a meaning and that it is affecting, right? Uh, lower down, right, there is the, um, the stage direction, she bites God in the wrist. A ma in immense spurt of blood lacerates the stage and through the biggest flash of lightning, the priest can be seen making the sign of the cross. Okay, she bites God in the wrist. That seems to be an affecting thing to put on stage. What does it mean in terms of theme and character and story and plot? Eh, who knows? But it is absolutely very affecting. Now, uh, this particular play, this is his most famous play, A Spirit of Blood, and I'll uh, share a link as well. Um, <laughs> now, you, you might also look at that and think, this is, this, is, this is nuts. How in the world is this important? He just sounds kind of like a, you know, some kind of like edgelord teenager, like, you know, complaining about how, you know, we need a new kind of theater kind of person, which, sure. Um, what else does he say about the theater of cruelty? The old duality between author and director will be dissolved, replaced by a sort of unique creator upon whom will devolve the double responsibility of the spectacle and the plot. He, he thinks he's inventing a director, but he's not actually. Right? But interestingly enough, in order to get this uh, idea of a, of a stage performance that uh, uh, enslaves the attention. What does he say? We abolish the stage all right, and the auditorium and replace them by a single site without partition or barrier of any kind, which will become the theater of the action. A direct communication will be reestablished between the spectator and the spectacle, between the actor and the spectator, from the fact that the spectator placed in the middle of the action is engulfed and physically affected by it. So it's kind of a reverse theater in the round, if you kind of think of it like that. Right? where you have an audience in the middle and the theater and the performance is everywhere so that there is no possible way for the audience to look anywhere that is not part of the performance, right? Now, I can absolutely see some people going to one of these particular plays and being um, frustrated <laughs> and annoyed by the uh, constant assault on the senses that the uh, actors do, but that's okay. For our toe, that's fine because it is the sensation and the reactions, the gut reactions that matter. And uh, one of the things that we'll notice right, when we have uh, Western theater practitioners encountering theater um, in the East, let's say, uh, there is uh, some orient Orientalism going on. There's some othering of uh, different cultures and using um, uh, exotic explanations 
uh, for things that are actually just completely the same. But Arto was not, um, he was not immune from this orientalizing. Um, let's say he says, so he went to Bali or to, um, and he looked at, he didn't speak any uh, Indonesian languages at all, but he went to Bali and saw some theater performances. And I think because he did not understand the language, of course he's not, he's going to um, uh, 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 experience the language as something other than kind of communicating concrete meanings. You know, he will look at it in a different way. He says, but by an altogether oriental means of expression, this objective and concrete language of the theater can fascinate and ensnare the organs. It flows into the sensibility, abandoning Occidental Western uh, usages of speech. It turns words into incantations. Okay. It extends the voice. It utilizes the vibrations and qualities of the voice. It wildly tramples rhythms underfoot. It pile drives sounds. It seeks to exalt, to benumb, to charm, to arrest the sensibility. It liberates a new lyricism of gesture, which by its precipitation or its amplitude in the air ends by surpassing the lyricism of words. It ultimately breaks away from the intellectual subjugation of the language by conveying by conveying a sense of a new and deeper intellectuality, which hides itself be beneath the gestures and signs raised to the dignity of particular exorcisms. All right, now, for a man who is uh, uh, complaining that language does not, um, uh, that words are somehow less meaningful than gestures, he absolutely has a lot of words, which is fine, it's fine. Um, so notice that when he's talking about language here, because Artaud talks about language and the, uh, the, the effect of language should be more than just to communicate ideas, right? It's not necessarily about ideas. He talks about um, the rhythm of language being the point, right? And so you would choose words in certain orders not to convey a meaning of a sentence necessarily, but to uh, evoke the feelings and sensations that those sounds themselves create. Um, and he even thought maybe words aren't even the best language, right? It has not been definitively proved that the language of words is the best possible language. And it seems that on the stage, which is above all a space to fill in a place where something happens, the language of words may have to give way before a language of signs whose objective aspect is the one that has the most immediate impact upon us, right? And so you can imagine going into an Artodian theater of cruelty, sitting down and having just an assault course on the senses, right? Somewhere between a nightmare and a, uh, a, a dance club, right? Happening to you, right? Which will affect you. It'll cause your heart to do different things, your breathing to do different things, your blood vessels, right? Your eyes, your pupils dilating, goosebumps, shivers, all these sorts of things. Those are the things that Arto wants to have in his theater. <laughs> But enough about Arto and big blocks of text. We're going to shift gears quite a bit and talk about another uh, non-realistic uh, theater practitioner, this fellow here with the great face, uh, Samuel Beckett, uh, born 1906, died 1989. Uh, he's Irish. He's part of the French resistance during World War II. Uh, he lived in Paris most of his life. Um, uh, incidentally, uh, knew Andre the Giant. Uh, he wrote in French, so he was an Irishman, right? But he wrote his plays in French and translated them back into English. And the reason he did that was he thought, well, if I write in a foreign language and then translate it back, I'll essentially be able to launder any style, right? Uh, through that process. And so in order to have my writing be with as little bit of style as possible, to have it just be the words themselves carrying the meaning and not how I use them per se. I'm going to write it in French and then tra translate it. He's a key figure in the theater of the absurd. And his plays largely focus on existentialism and the breakdown of human communication, the difficulty of people communicating with each other. Now, um, uh, uh, Samuel Beckett's play, uh, one play that he wrote is called Breath. And I'm going to show it to you right now. Um, the, where is it? Okay, here we go. Breath by Samuel Beckett, right? So this play is one page long. Now, when you think about theater, you might think, well, uh, what are the basic elements of theater? Well, you need like, you know, a performer. This play does not have any performers. Um, and it is written by, you know, this Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, Samuel Beckett. Let's read this for a second. 
and this is it, so it won't be long. Curtain. A faint light on stage littered with miscellaneous rubbish, hold for about five seconds. A faint brief cry, an immediately inspiration and slow increase of light together, reaching maximum together in about 10 seconds. Silence and hold about five seconds. Three, expiration and slow decrease of light together, reaching minimum together, light as in one, in about 10 seconds and immediately cry as before. Silence and hold about five seconds. Curtain. And that's the play. There's trash on stage for a little bit. There's a cry of a baby being born. And they breathe in, the lights come up. Then the lights go down, and there's a cry again. No one comes on stage, nothing even moves on stage. And there's not even necessarily bits of scenery on stage, uh, distinct other than the fact that they are miscellaneous rubbish. Right? So this play, <laughs> you might think, well, okay, why? But it absolutely has a beginning, middle, and end. It has, um, you know, light and sound and experience are the things that uh, cause you to, uh, 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 to move from one part of the play to the other. In contrast to someone like Artaud, right, it is not necessarily the, the, uh, the physical kind of sensory experience of what you're seeing. But it's actually closer a little bit in my mind to the experience of seeing no theater, right? where it would be uh, more of the, uh, the, the, the frame of mind. It's almost meditative in that way. Uh, I'm going to put another link to a show called uh, Rockabye, um, which I will very much encourage you to see. Um, it's very interesting. So let's get back to uh, uh, Monsieur uh, Beckett here. Right, so this fellow. Uh, he wrote in 1952 his most famous play, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning Waiting for Godot, or Godot, depending. Um, a critic said it is a play in which nothing happens twice, <laughs> which is great. Um, it is a play where the two people, Vladimir and Estragon, um, they uh, are near a rock and near a tree, and they are waiting for someone else to come whose name, Godot, and they wait, and they wait. Godot doesn't show up in the first act. In the middle, there's uh, uh, Pazzo and Lucky, two random people who are wandering by. They talk, but then they leave. And then Godot still doesn't show up. They're just waiting there to ask each other, should we leave? No, no, we're just because we're waiting. At the very end, a, uh, a young boy comes and says, oh, um, Godot is going to be here tomorrow. No, he's not going to be here today. So, okay. Act two rolls around. Curtain up. Vladimir and Estragon are waiting for Godot. They're waiting, they're waiting. Pazzo and Lucky come by again. They leave. They're still waiting. The boy comes back in at the very end and says, okay, well, he's going to come tomorrow. And that's the play. Right? Um, it's very interesting. And uh, uh, this is kind of a, uh, an image of um, waiting for your dough. Um, right? These hats are important. The tree is important. The, uh, the rock is important. Um, uh, Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart had a long, long running version of Waiting for Godot on, in the West End. Uh, 1957, he wrote a play called Endgame. Ooh, this is striking. Um, crap, happy Days, Breath, Not I, Crap's Last Tape. Um, crap's Last Tape, John Hurt. Um, this Happy Days, this woman who is talking to her husband behind about how great a day is, and she's uh, you know, throughout the different acts, she starts getting buried more and more up. Not I is a play, <laughs> I'm now in almost blackness now, right? Um, but Not I is a play where there is just a hole cut into a curtain where it's just a mouth talking throughout the entire play. Um, but, so Samuel Beckett, uh, I again will put uh, Rockabye, uh, a link to that particular, a, a YouTube kind of thing of that show. Um, and that is all I'm going to talk about for them today. I'm going to put breath and a spurt of blood as well. Um, I hope you all are doing great, and I will uh, see you next Tuesday uh, to talk about Fafu and her friends.